Hey everyone, welcome to the 220th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and today's co-host is... Kevin Tofel. As always. Alrighty, today we've got some awesome stuff for you. We're going to talk about our dystopian future with facial recognition. Also, selling advertising based on your emotional state. And Facebook is not giving up on the portal. In less dystopian news, we're going to be talking about Uber's Elevate service and how it may work with 5G networks. Amazon has halted sales of one of its connected devices, and Google has a $25 IoT dev board that's actually worth taking a look at. Plus, we're going to hear from our sponsor, Dell Technologies, and our guest this week is Dominique Guinard, who is the CTO of everything. Now, Whoa. that's not all the things. That's just the platform for RFID, NFC, etc. tags that are placed into consumer goods. It's a really fun interview. We're going to talk about how to connect a billion sensors. But first, let's go to a message from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is Nordic Semiconductor. Kickstart your short-range wireless application ideas with the NRF52840. It's the most advanced and flexible short-range wireless solution available today. The NRF52840 is a highly advanced, ultra-low power system on chip that can meet just about any requirement in ultra-low power wireless applications. It has broad protocol support, including Bluetooth 5 and all of its features, Bluetooth LE, Thread, Zigbee, and 2.4 gigahertz proprietary with protocol concurrency options. The NRF52840 can support the most demanding applications with its Cortex M4F CPU and 1 megabyte of flash and 256 kilobytes of RAM. Plus, it's stacked with on chip peripherals including USB, CryptoCell, Quad SPI, and NFC. Everyone knows software makes the difference, and the NRF52840 is backed up with an unrivaled selection of comprehensive SDKs covering a vast range of applications to get you building tomorrow's great products. Find out more at www.nordicsemi.com slash NRF52840. All right. Kevin, are you ready for dystopia? Dystopia and surveillance. Yes, I am. Okay. Well, let's get started. We've got a couple big stories happening this week. First, I'm going to, I'll start off with the hacking of the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol database, partially because here I am in Canada this week. As I'm walking through customs in Montreal, I was like, oh, hey, I wonder if my photograph is being taken and it, used. It is. It, it is. is. <laughs> I, I stood in front of the little passport machine and it was like, Doo -doo. So I guess we should start with the story. Kevin, you want to tell us what's going on? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you are away out of the country. Apparently, um, the Customs and Border Protection Agency, which had stored or has is storing um, images of travelers and license plates, apparently tens of thousands of those images, I don't know exactly how many yet, were basically hacked. The U.S. government reportedly says no more than 100,000 people have had their information compromised. The way this hack worked, it wasn't Customs and Border Protection itself, which has the data. It was a contractor, a subcontractor that works for the CBP. They transferred copies of images to their network, and that network was hacked. And they are not supposed to be actually transferring those images at all, so that's, you know, faux pas number two. So that's the story, but it leads to much larger questions about surveillance. About lots of things. So this is actually very similar Sony. The big Sony hack from a couple years ago happened the same way. It was a third-party contractor that was hacked, which first off, everybody who's gathering any kind of data, be it for your customers or on consumers, really, you should be evaluating your third-party contractor's security practices, like as much as your own. So we'll just get that out of the way first. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the, the second aspect, which is the surveillance issue. So this is disturbing for a couple of reasons. One, the U.S. government has been using facial recognition and pulling this data without really talking to people about how it was being used. It even gives airlines access to this data if they want it. So there's been a lot of controversy right now about how people are using 
image data and facial recognition without talking to people about how they're doing this first. And I think to underscore your point, it was only a few months ago that everybody was up in arms when some people were going to flights at U.S. airports and all of a sudden noticed these little cameras. And there was no knowledge of that in advance. It was just there. It's like, what do you do at that point? Decide not to go on your flight because you want to review... The terms and conditions or the security <laughs> exactly. practices of their third-party contractors? First, you check and make sure it's not a Boeing Max 770 or whatever that was. Uh, but second, yeah, you, you check and see, are they, are they taking your, your picture there? And then if they are, what are they doing with it? Yeah, so... It's very quiet. That's the thing. Like, as you said, it's not being discussed. At least in China, we know this is all happening and maybe... I would imagine the Chinese uh, citizens building, know what's happening. And they're building services on it. They're advertising services yeah, built exactly. on it. Right. So here it is, it's a little bit more clandestine. And there's also no consent happening among users. The frustrating thing is what happens when this is hacked. So now people have my picture that's associated very accurately with my name. So accurately enough for the U.S. government, which I don't know if I used to have an expression, it's good enough for government, right? Uh, <laughs> which usually means it's not that great. But I, I don't know if I should rethink that now in this this particular era. But so they have access to this. I don't know. It talks about license plate data. The U.S. government also has a lot of biometric data. They have my fingerprint data, for example, as part of this Customs and Border Protection Agency mm -hmm. has my fingerprint data as part of the Nexus Global Entry Program. If that kind of information gets hacked, then suddenly people have a way to possibly access things that in, in the physical world even. Mm -hmm. you know? And as we start moving to biometric authenticators, that could give strangers easy access to ways to get into any number of other people's files or homes or that sort of thing. I hate to ask this question because I, I don't even want to think about the answer, but how much longer here in the U.S. do you think it will be before it's more like what China does today in terms of the surveillance? I mean, in the newsletter a week or two ago, there was a, a great video about being in China, what it's like to be there if you're not a citizen. Maybe you're a startup company, you're working in Shenzhen to get hardware. And one of the guys who's from Austria for some company that's building um, a digital ski coach product, he jaywalked, the camera caught him, and in 20 seconds, he got his ticket over WeChat. And because he had funds in WeChat, the ticket was paid for immediately. The funds were just taken out. And he's not even a Chinese citizen. He just happens to be in China. How long before we, we get there? Because I think we're going to, and I'm not saying I, I want to be, but I think we will be. So what's interesting, especially about that example, is I think we could be there very quickly. I think we won't get there from a practical standpoint because there would be lots of lawsuits over things like that. But the larger issue and one that's inherently about fairness is – if you have this automated eye in the sky that can enforce every law, right? So see if someone's jaywalking and then enforce that law. If it's automated, it creates a much more fair society in the sense mm -hmm. that right now, predominantly African Americans get picked up for jaywalking, right? Police mm -hmm. will stop them as opposed to a white person. And the question then becomes, what laws does a society decide to enforce if you're going to have it? by automation. Right. Where it applies to everybody regardless. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's true. There's pros and cons. I mean, ultimately my knee jerk reaction is, whoa, that is creepy as all get out. Sure. But if we also then took a hard look at the laws that we want to enforce or the outcomes we would like to see from those laws, we might actually be able to make a more fair society. But I think it's a really slippery slope and I don't really want to go down it. Fair enough. All right, let's see. And speaking of enforcement and facial recognition, <laughs> you came across a pretty creepy story. <laughs> I did. And it's about a new set of smart glasses made by an American company, Vuzix, which almost every year at CES, I see some new product from them in this space, but I've never really seen anything viable come to market. And I'm really hoping this one doesn't, but unfortunately, it looks like it is. They are making smart glasses that work on basically software and services from a Dubai-based firm called NNTC. And NNTC provides them facial recognition algorithms. There's an 8 megapixel camera in the glasses. You can then wear these and scan faces in a crowd. 
and the data is compared against uh, a database of 1 million images. And literally, these things can detect 15 faces per frame per second. That's it, very That's quickly. Crazy. Yeah. So you can, you can scan through a crowd to find maybe a suspect of, of something, say, if you're police, which is what I think they're starting to target these for. And I know that in China, going back to that, they do have something similar uh, to these. We don't here in the U.S., but I think uh, we might soon. I don't, I don't know yet. There's only been 50 pairs produced, so it's not like these are mass-produced yet. But I yeah, could so see imagine, some places. Imagine this in use at like a, a protest that would be beyond scary because then you're logged in a way. I mean, we're already seeing this right now with people yeah. like the FBI going through people's Facebook pages to see where they are. And there are a lot of places. Like I remember, you know, going through London a couple of years back, there's cameras everywhere. So there are tons of like closed circuit cameras in various countries and regions where it's, they can apply facial recognition algorithms to the data there. So it's not like this is new. What's new about it is that it's mobile, right? Yes. And imagine being able to hack into the biometric data, for example. Mm. Imagine being able to not just hack into it, but maybe hack into the system and change that data. Suddenly, you have this like, oh, hey, if you're a criminal, maybe you change your own face. Or maybe if you're- You frame somebody. You frame not, to make a, not to make a pun with glasses, but yes, you frame somebody. Exactly. So- uh, all right, big yeah. shutter. We are entering this scary, Creepy zone. scary world. Let's talk about another scary thing, which is, <laughs> or, you know, potentially good, potentially scary. Uh, Spotify is creating playlists based on emotions. They've been doing that for a while, which I use that feature all the time. But now I'm like, I don't know if I want to use that anymore because now we just found out they're selling the data about your moods. For advertising purposes. And wow, I mean, that's a whole different set of advertising data. Yeah, because I've, I've often, you know, I look at Spotify and I go in and tweak my privacy settings. I actually, every time I buy a new device or a new subscription, I go to the privacy setting first and I make sure everything is private, right? That's just mm -hmm. my default. I recommend everyone do this. But now I'm like, oh man, when I'm in my mellow mood, they're going to be like selling at, oh, Stacy's in a mellow mood right now. Picture a candle. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's exactly it. You know, so like an example in the, the story that we found, listeners who are quote unquote working, you know, they're likely to be feeling pressure and stress. So, you know, you, you start advertising something that will de-stress them or something. And they go, ah, okay, let me, let me buy this candle or whatever it is. Um, yeah. And tied to that, a couple of weeks ago, Amazon, the news came out, Bloomberg reported that Amazon was just playing around with the idea of a wrist-worn wearable that would track people's moods. And possibly, you know, some of the theories were like, oh, yeah, maybe we could help people interact better with other people and be more socially adept. I actually like this idea, the scope of it, what they do with it. I would be thrilled if my digital assistant could read my mood that way because, you know, it's not camera, so it's not that invasive, you know. I'd be okay with that. What if your mood was sexy times? Well, they would know what music to play, I guess. <laughs> they would know to dim the lights. Exactly. I'm like, mm. <laughs> I don't. I mean, there's a lot of moods. Like, I mean, sometimes when I'm in a bad mood, I don't even tell my family because I'm like, sometimes, you know, when you're like pouting or really sulky, you're like, I mm. know I should not be in this mood, right? It's. <laughs> Don't talk to mom. Madam A says she's in a bad mood. Exactly. You're like, <laughs> I don't really want people to know I'm I'm having a temper tantrum because that is not cool. I mean, most of my family does know anyway, but but still. So mm. I don't trust any of these companies enough to give them that kind of level of data, even if it does make my home a better place, right? So mm. I think I'm willing to draw the line at emotional surveillance. I don't know where Kevin's going to draw the line. Maybe we'll hit it. Maybe we won't. I don't have many lines that I won't cross. <laughs> so. I know, man. Just because I like to try things and learn about, you know, the implications of, of things and what the value is for the cost and so on. So if they said to me, we do have this product and you want to beta it, yeah, I would do it. All right. That's, that's your open book. So you would go. you beta the new Facebook portal video chat devices? I didn't even beta the old ones because I won't touch those things. <laughs> so uh, no, this is no. this is curious. So did you draw the line because you just don't trust Facebook? Did you draw the line because yes. of the utility? Okay. 
No, it's face. Oh, video chat. I mean, I, I video chat with my son almost every day. Um, we video uh, chat. You, you and I do video chat sometimes looking at our worst. Yes. But, Wait a second. I am always wonderful. Uh, okay. Dead silence. Say so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I get utility out of video chatting without a doubt. But I don't need to use Facebook's platform to do so and get what I need. And I'm not getting anything extra from them. Uh, if I use their platform, so why bother is my take. And I know there's people that bought this thing. I've never seen them, but if you bought it and you can live with it, so be it. It's, uh, there's a there's a market for it for certain people. I'm just not one of them. I'll bring in another story. So there is a story about AI recognizing commonplace household objects like soaps mm. and detergents. With vision. Yeah. yeah. And I was thinking about, oh, Facebook would love to know like the products in my house. And then I was like, holy cow, Amazon, thanks to the Echo Show, already knows lots of products in my house. Yeah. I don't know if it's pulling that data. So this particular story was about how the AI algorithms are much better at recognizing things from first world countries, basically. So if you're in a poorer country with generic poor people, so I don't know what that is, or brands from like African countries, hey, the AI doesn't recognize those because the engineers usually, they test mm. this on their, their own stuff and there's not they, a lot they, of annotated data. Yeah, they need to expand the model with these other products to teach it. And so it's... Or, know, that's- or maybe they don't expand the model, but maybe they're aware of the the blind spot. You know, it's, I, I don't think it's- I don't think they care. They're trying to get the most bang for buck here. So all right, they don't, they don't, I, I it's my opinion. I don't think they care, but Big, bigger model well, it is. Bigger model it is. The more the better. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we said you mentioned beta test these Facebook portal things. Apparently, um, according to CNBC, Facebook has said that they have new versions of their portal video chat coming this fall, different form factors, perhaps. We, before the show, were trying to guess what those form factors would be, and you don't even want to think about what we thought about because I have no idea what else they could be doing. What about a, like a watch? Would you talk to your watch like Dick Tracy? You do talk to your watch. I know I you do. Want to talk to you on absolutely. your watch. Absolutely. Yeah. So what about video chat on your watch? No, I don't find that there'd be the right place because video chat for me tends to be a long form kind of thing where I'll, I'll spend 5, 10, 30 minutes, whatever, depending on the person and the and the purpose. Whereas talking to my watch is very micro transactional, send a text, reply to somebody, etc. So no, no, I don't think that's it. Hmm. My video chats tend to be very transactional. It's like, let me show you this place that I'm at. Oh, check this out. And then we switch to voice or hmm. weird. Huh. All right. We're very different. <laughs> Holy cow. All righty. Let's talk about 5G. Man, I mean, what has it been like? Five <laughs> because seconds? we haven't. We haven't in a day. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of exciting things about this story. 5G is actually not one of the more exciting things, but <laughs> AT&T is working with Uber's Elevate team to test out basically how do you bring cell service into air taxis and drones. 5G is really just thrown in here, I think, for a marketing purpose, because right now Uber and AT&T are using the LTE network to see how to connect the Uber's potential taxis. air taxis. I'm like, they're not yeah. even real. The interesting thing about this press release was that they were saying that Uber expects Elevate to launch its first taxis. In 2023, which is only four years from now. Hmm. Well, that's something else I would pay to test, although not at a very tall height. Like you said, the 5G bit is thrown in here because of marketing. I even question why it's in there at all, because when you talk about millimeter wave and line of sight for, for some of these signals, well, how do you do that with an air taxi without spending billions and billions on infrastructure? Well, line of sight, I mean, if you're going up, you're orienting your antennas up, there's not actually as much stuff up there. You know, there's no buildings at a certain point. The latency elements there are compelling. Yes. Do you think the power management though? I mean, a lot of 5G, what it's going to look like, I actually talked to somebody from NXP recently about managing the radios. And what's going to happen is a lot of these companies are going to deploy in the millimeter wave band for 5G. And then they're going to fall back to like an LTE service if that millimeter wave isn't available or it's just unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And all of that processing that's going to happen, that has to happen like on the drone and at the base station level. And that's going to just gobs of power, just suck up gobs of power. So I really am like 
Yeah, and that becomes important when if you run out of power <laughs> in the air, See, no millimeter wave is going to help you. <laughs> yeah, a taxi, you know, that like a car, they have batteries, a bigger battery rather. I know, I know. But I, know. I mean like a drone, that's a that's a concern. So yeah. We'll see. I guess that really sums up my... I think it's going to have to be like Coruscant and Star Wars. I apologize for the reference, but they're just going to have space lanes. You know, you're going to have to stay in your lane if you're driving in the air. That's all there is to it. I'm not even going to ask you about this. I don't... People who know Star Wars, they'll understand. All right. Trust me. Hey, did you buy the Amazon Blink X-T2 video camera? I know we talked about reviewing it, but I never we did. got one. <laughs> we, we did. I did not get one, nor did I buy one. This was the battery-powered video camera, if I am correct. Yeah, and the Blink cameras have been around for a while. Amazon bought Blink in 2016. <laughs> this um, one wasn't around for, hasn't been around a while. <laughs> no, no, this one. How long has this been around? Two weeks? Oh, not long. Yeah, it was just back in May that they started uh, taking orders and launch this product and already it's early June and you can't buy it anymore. It's currently unavailable. Yeah. Amazon has temporarily stopped taking orders for this camera. They did it because it was getting bad reviews with some buyers saying that it had poor range between their camera and their router, bad software, bad movement detection. And so Amazon said, hold on, let's take a closer look. I don't know if this is true, but purportedly a Amazon reviewer for the product wrote on his Amazon review, I got an email from the founder of Blink letting me know they are working on the unexpected issues, which he doesn't expand upon, and are very willing to work with me to get this figured out. So there's issues. And this is hard. And how hard is it? It's so hard that, I don't know if you guys remember, we talked about the August View doorbell. They actually pulled that like three weeks after its launch. And this was a battery powered, just like the Blink camera, battery powered video doorbell. And yeah. This was also because it was behaving inconsistently. What can we say? It's hard to do battery-powered video devices, especially because yeah. they have to use Wi-Fi, so that's a power suck, so you've got to figure something out there. You've got to have this sleep and awake modes are very difficult on this because you basically, you know, if it's movement detection you're after, the second it detects movement, you want it to start recording or you want it to already have been recording and just, like, delete recordings continuously. So this is really this is really a struggle for companies. I suspect this is why we don't see yet a wise battery powered camera. Yeah, I mean Arlo's done a good job here, but even Arlo actually gets gets yelled at sometimes for basically sucking up batteries. And they've actually got their own wireless in their early cameras, they had a hub that worked with the camera, which I assume is a, a more robust wireless protocol to handle mm. things like lag and things like that. That's that news. What about Google and their dev board for environmental sensors and IoT core, Kevin? Yeah, this is cool for the tinkerers out there. Um, if you have a Raspberry Pi, you can now buy for $25 an add-on board, 40-pin add-on board, that is for Google Coral. Uh, it is an environmental board. It's the Coral dev board. And, and that it has, was the machine hmm. learning board with the TPUs, Yes. So the TPU is, is a separate USB plug-in. Okay. And what that does is that lets you do machine learning without the cloud. You kind of bring it down to the edge, and you can then connect maybe this board to that, for example. I know it does support that. So you're going to have so a bunch of daisy-chain boards. <laughs> daisy-chain wires and boards. So like I said, the tinkerers. Yeah. But yeah, you, you can get TensorFlow on the edge TPU to work with this. Um, it also works with Python and C++ APIs. It's got a humidity and temperature sensor, an ambient light sensor, a barometric pressure and about four yes four grove connectors so you can add on other things uh, you know it's like i said it's something for like iot development it's not something that consumers are going to go buy but i thought it was kind of cool well could you use it to make our our fabled washer dryer sensor <laughs> the infamous washer dryer sensor i think you could i don't see why not i wish it had vibration but it doesn't have that mm. okay. yeah I'm like, humidity? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> when the washer is going, it's slightly more humid. Maybe. I All right. There's a lot of ways we can skin that cat. We just haven't figured it out yet. Okay. Well, I think that's enough for this week, especially since I'm traveling and just coming off the move. Guys, I cannot wait for the move to be finished. We are so close now. So maybe in the next week or two, 
I actually know the first thing I'm going to do, and it relates to this week's voicemail question, which is from Lynn. Before we hear it, the IoT Podcast Hotline is sponsored this month by Afero. With the fifth largest IoT patent portfolio in the world, Afero provides a proven IoT platform that doesn't risk your brand. Afero customers have experienced as much as an 80% reduction in time to market and 10x higher activation rates. Learn more at afero.io. All right, and now, to the voicemail. Hi, Stacey and Kevin. This is Lynn from Maryland. I was curious, what would you say is your most underrated feature of your smart home that you would tell a new smart home aficionado? Thanks. Lynn, that's such a good question. And I will tell you the first thing I'm going to do when I get back, since I now have internet access in my house and my smart devices unpacked, I'm actually going to set up a motion sensor in my Hue light bulbs. So the Hue motion sensor and the Hue bulbs, although you can do it with generic bulbs and sensors in a smart things platform, I'm going to set that lighting thing up in my laundry room. I cannot get over how much I miss walking into my laundry room with my arms full of laundry and having the lights turn on automatically and then turn off, you know, two minutes after no motion has been detected. It's such a small thing, but I love it. And not having it has driven me absolutely crazy. And I haven't moved, but I almost wish I had because I would love that perspective. Like, what would I miss the most? What would be like the very first thing I'd have to put back in place? Oh, just turn the an- internet off in your house. Oh, I could do that. Just yeah, for like okay. a week. <laughs> the family will love that. Yes. No YouTube TV for you. Come back one year. But I have to say the most unexpected, I'm going to go with unexpected as well as underrated value that I've gotten from my smart home, and I've mentioned this probably a year ago because I think that's when it happened, was having a webcam inside my house looking out the front window where my driveway and the road is. We live in a townhouse community, so we sometimes park on the road and sometimes have cars in the driveway. But I didn't put it out there for that. I put it out there to see who's walking up the path to come around to the front door, etc. And yet, a $20 wise cam which is what it is now. It was a nest when I had it back in play for this particular instance, saved me $1,500 because it captured a neighbor hitting my parked car on the street. And that was used as evidence for the insurance claim because the neighbor claims she did not hit the car. I never thought I would use it for that. And I made the money back on that webcam many, many times over. And I would never get rid of it for that very reason, because you never know when you're going to have views for it like that. All right. And in a slightly more expensive camera, but similar use case, I would recommend to you guys the Logitech Circle 2. It's not as cheap as the Wise Cam, but it has this great filtering that makes it so when you use it in the specific, I am putting it inside and pointing it outside, it doesn't get the glare off the window at night. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. it's also HomeKit certified, and it will be one of the first cameras that work with the Apple's secure video API that Apple talked gotcha. about last week at WWDC. And I'm in Canada right now, so I'm looking at prices and seeing Canada prices. Kevin, how much is that in the U.S.? Here in the U.S., it looks like it retails for about $180. I don't know what it's showing up in Canadian dollars. Uh, Amazon does have it for like uh, $12 less here right now. Excellent. So it's more expensive, but if you're trying to catch like things happening at night in your house and you have money you'd like to burn, that is another option. Okay. I realized we didn't talk about any of Apple's news. You did mention the video camera API and just real quick to say what it is. Like basically it was really clever of Apple who was continuing to double down on privacy as, as a way to stand out from the crowd here. HomeKit cameras that are enabled with this API, the video streams won't be sent to the cloud of the hardware manufacturer, which could often be a third-party cloud provider. They instead will be encrypted and then sent to iCloud. And you will not pay for the storage. Apple will hang on to that storage for 10 days. And even Apple will not be able to see what's been captured on video. So therefore, there's no privacy implications, no advertising implications, etc. So they're really cutting out a lot of these uh, hardware makers from basically from the, the revenues potentially that they were getting from all these camera monitoring services. Yeah. And they also actually Apple also addressed another big question that we get here a lot 
at the podcast, which is how do you secure your home network for your IoT devices? Mm -hmm. And at WWDC, Apple did say that they're working with a few router makers, Spectrum, Linksys, and Eero, which ironically will soon be owned by Amazon. But what they're going to be doing is HomeKit certified routers. And these are going to have three different layers of control. So all of your HomeKit devices on the network you'll be able to select the device and then you'll be able to say, hey, restrict this only to the home, which means it can only talk to things in the home, home kit devices in the home. Automatic, which is restricted from talking to outside weird websites, but like its own website and a few others are fine. And then no restrictions, which is like, let it do whatever <laughs> it wants. Which is open up your front door and walk away from your house. So that's really interesting. And I can't wait to hear about people's experiences on this because it does seem like, one, it's an extra layer of complexity. And two, people I think are going to be like, ooh, most secure, restrict to home. But then they're going to be pissed when things like Amazon Echo cloud integrations don't work, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens. That's kind of the big news from Apple. We'll talk about more of that as we see iOS 13 because there's some cool HomeKit related shortcuts that'll be happening there, but we'll wait till we can play with it. That's all the news for this week. Let's stay tuned for our guest, Dominique Guinard, who is the CTO of everything. We are going to be talking about what it means when we have a trillion connected devices, either NFC, Bluetooth based tags, even our can of Campbell soup might one day have a little tag on it. What does that mean for the rest of us? But before we get into that, let's hear from this week's sponsor. Hey, everyone, we are taking a quick break from this week's Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Dell Technologies. And I'm here today with John Dows Curtis, or JD, the sales VP of Edge and IoT solutions for Dell Technologies. JD, your team is talking about becoming data first. What does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. And given just the sheer quantity of data that's being created nowadays, remember, 175 trillion gigabytes by the year 2025. The cloud-first point of view that has been dominating the news over the last several years, namely the idea that everything should be pushed to a public cloud, is just not practical. There is just too much data coming our way, generating from the edge. And to push all of it into the cloud is just impractical. We need to think today, instead of a cloud-first strategy, a data-first strategy. In other words, rather than starting to determine what a particular cloud can do for you, thinking of it more from what is your data and what can your data do for you. So that means an increasing focus on the edge. And why is edge computing essential for success in industrial-scale IoT? Yeah, in a data-first world, you know, moving the data and performing actions closer to the edge is going to be critical. There are three main reasons we feel you need to look at this. One, the overall volume, the sheer volume of data generated at the edge today is massive and it's growing exponentially. Gartner predicts that the edge data will comprise 75% of the enterprise data by the year 2022, and it's up 10% today. When you think of it from a cost perspective, again, based on the amount of data, it is just too expensive to move everything to the cloud. More activities and analytics need to be done at the edge. And then speed, most importantly. The ability to make a decision right there at the edge is critical. The favorite example of this is an autonomous car. If a pedestrian suddenly walks in front of the car and a car has to tell the cloud, hey, something suddenly appeared in front of me, can you tell me what to do? Before the cloud can tell the car, hit the brakes. It's too late. That decision needs to be done at the edge. Aside from cars, what are customers doing at the edge? What are you seeing? Yeah, we've actually seen quite a bit of work done. In fact, just recently, we finished up some research with Forrester. They basically took and looked at some of the IoT-enabled use cases and ones where we're ready to deploy. And the study showed that security surveillance was no doubt number one in the highest general use case. But they're also starting to see a big traction in, in track and trace and the energy management. Awesome. So what does Tell Technologies offer for those looking at the edge? We've come to the market with very specific purpose-built edge devices for IoT in the form of an IoT embedded PC, as well as in our gateway products. But we also have an incredible range of products of servers, hyperconverged solutions, client-scale computing that can meet a wide range of needs. Excellent. So where can folks go to learn more? To find out more information, your listeners can come to dellteknologies.com forward slash IoT 
to read the forestry report I mentioned, as well as find out about our growing portfolio of edge products. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Hagenbotham, and today's guest is Dominique Guinard, who is CTO at Everything. Hello, Dominique, how are you? Hello, I'm fine. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm a big fan of this show, so it's great to be a part of it. Excellent. Well, I am super glad you're here, and we should probably kick it off with you explaining to us what everything is. Sure. Everything is an identity provider for all kinds of products, but in particular, CPG, apparel, and luxury goods, as well as food products. And we essentially provide a unique web identity for each of these products. And these identities can be used for all kinds of applications, consumer-facing applications, but also supply chain-related applications, product authenticity, and all kinds of analytics for the brands. We are going to get into that. And I should tell everybody, if you're not familiar, CPG stands for Consumer Packaged Goods. This can be everything from toilet paper to Campbell's Soup. So I have been covering or aware of everything probably since like 2012. And I feel like you were, you guys were very early in the IoT. I don't want to call it a bubble because I think there's a lot of realness here. So what have you learned in the past few years of doing this? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's impressive that you you knew about us back in 2012, because that was a few months after we started. And indeed, the world changed quite a bit since then. You know, we started in the space we're in today. So we started really thinking of connecting absolutely every single item to the internet. And that's why, hence the name of the company, everything. And then the markets that we were targeting were not quite ready back then. So we were already targeting CPG and apparel, for instance. Two markets where Internet of Things technologies, serialization, smart tags were not quite at the cost that they needed to be for really the use cases to flourish. So throughout the evolution of everything, we went into more, I'd say, traditional IoT, although the roots of IoT are very much in RFID and and tagging items. But when I say traditional IoT, I mean what people assume as the IoT today, which is, you know, smart homes, connected cities. So we did a a bit more of that. But then there was a lot of competition in this space. And and as we were exploring this space of more connected things, the world of less connected things, the world of tagged things started to have some real breakthroughs in cost of tags, cost of serialization, in standardization. And also generally in consumer demands for more transparency, more information about the brands that we were working with. And so all of that actually made it possible for us to realign on our uh, initial objectives. And that's what we're doing today. And it's great. Okay, tons of questions here. So you guys are using RFID tags. And let's talk about how the costs have changed over time, because I am not 100% up to date on where things used to be and where they are now. Yeah, so we we don't only use RFID tags. We're basically agnostic of the tag technology. So we use RFID, NFC, QR codes, visual tags. We also use things like Bluetooth beacons or even LP1 devices. For your question specifically about RFID tags, there was always this holy grail five cent per tag or less was what, you know, many analysts promised back in in early 2000. And this actually didn't materialize for real until probably one, one and a half year ago for RFID, where the prices went actually below five cent and and even even at close to one cent in in massive deployments. For other transponder technologies, such as uh, NFC, for instance, took a little bit longer. and, And it was announced just six months ago that the first tags at five cent had reached the market. And that was announced by, uh, by NXP tags at five cent for uh, not massive volumes. I think it's about 10,000 per order to reach five cent which really unlocks a large number of use cases that were not possible before. It sure does. I remember when things were 50 cents or even a dollar, and then you were like, ooh, only on high value items. So it sounds like we need better standards, which feels obvious, but what's happening on that front? Absolutely. Standardization is a key for mass scale adoption and for really reaching the trillions. And uh, 
there I'm, I'm really excited to be part of a standard that didn't make much noise yet, but I think will make a lot of noise in the future. You probably know the 1D barcodes that you have on all your products. This 1D barcode is actually not accessible to consumers and not accessible on the internet and on the web. Well, this has changed with the GS1 Digital Link Standard that was released uh, last August. You now have a way of serializing product identities into URLs. And these URLs are then great to put into QR codes, NFC tags, or all kinds of two-dimensional data carriers. So that standard is basically turning the good old 1D barcode into a 2D barcode that now can talk to consumers. And that's a very big shift. The Movi example that we talked about before, this is a digital link at mass scale in market. And lots of pilots are happening with big brands now, uh, big brands behind the digital link standard. So what does a deployment look like generally? In if you're network agnostic, you're focused on the thing, how does this work in practice? So the first thing you want to reach is serialization, because if you look at the CPG markets or apparel markets or, or generally the food markets as well, we haven't reached serialization at mass scale. With serialization come a very large number of use cases that you can't do when you are at the generic level. If you pick up a product today, a CPG product, you have an identification of this product. It's usually taking the form of a 1D barcode. UPC or EAN or GTINs, as they're called today. And those don't identify the bottle you have in your hand or uh, the salad you, you picked. They identify the class of product. So they're generic level identifiers. Serialization means to be able to identify the item you have in your hands. Each item has a different number, has a different uh, web address in our case. And that is big because it enables a large number of things that you couldn't do before. That is insane. I mean, I don't, we're talking like billions of unique IDs, correct? Trillions, actually. I trillions. Mean, our, yeah, our, our goal is to reach one trillion. Our slightly ambitious goal is to reach one trillion By items. When? Depends who you ask, right? If you ask the CTO or the marketing lead, you'll have different answers. Well, I'm talking to the CTO. <laughs> so what does that look well, like? The CTO would like to reach it as soon as possible, but also knows that one trillion data points is, is a very, very hard thing to manage. And I also know it's not going to happen overnight, but I can imagine in five to 10 years, I can truly imagine this could be possible. Okay. So you're building for this, but you're like, oh, we're going to need some things along the way. Exactly. Okay. We'll get to that in a bit because I am curious what kind of technology and what kind of resources you're going to need to support a trillion. But in the meantime... Let's go back to how this works. So now as a company, if I am able to identify each unique item, how does that work in practice when I manufacture it and I put the tag on the packaging to it is coming out of the store or I've got a consumer with a, I don't know, maybe an app or scanning the barcode? Like, how does this work? You know, serialization is not entirely new. You, you already had mass scale serialization on, on expensive items. For instance, I know that Swiss watches or certain luxury items had serialization for, for a while already. And I think the breakthrough in the past few years is to make this serialization truly accessible and linked to a, a web identity. So what we do at everything is that every item gets a URL, a unique URL. Now, what that means is that throughout the supply chain, you can interact with the API of this thing. So every single thing really gets an API and you can build applications much more easily than when this identity was not a web identity. It also means that we can put this web identity into tags or data carriers, as we call them in, in, uh, in, in the auto ID space. You can put this identity very easily into things like QR codes or NFC tags which allow consumers to scan them very, very easily. If you have an iPhone or, an, or a recent Android device, you can scan an NFC tag and read the URL very easily. Same thing with QR codes. Your iOS camera supports reading QR codes with URLs out of the box. So just by changing this identity into a serialized identity and a web identity, you drastically change the game because it, now it's an API integration at every step in the supply chain and beyond the supply chain, you can reach out to consumer, which wasn't possible before. Got it. All right. So let's talk about what that looks like through one of your recent use cases. I think you have one with a, a salmon fishery that I was fascinated by. Yeah, that's that's a pretty interesting one with uh, one of the leaders in the uh, 
in the market of Atlantic Salmon. And the brand is called Movi. And they have an increasing demand from consumers to basically have full traceability on the salmon they sell. And the salmon industry just like generally the fresh food industry, is really under pressure from consumers to provide full transparency. So basically, they onboarded on this project of basically being able to identify each salmon, at least at the batch level, and to provide information to the consumers in a way that's really fairly accessible so that they can really know where the salmon comes from, literally where the egg was first uh, put in water, then when the salmon was moved from the river to the sea, and then when the salmon was harvested, exactly which weight the salmon had, and then the journey of the salmon to the store. So you can really learn uh, a lot about it. So that seems fun as a consumer. So I, I get it from a marketing perspective. I have two things there. One is how often do consumers actually scan their items? So I'm, I'm trying to imagine being in the grocery store and I don't buy a lot of meat. I do buy a lot of produce. I don't know if I'm going to scan every single item. So that's one. I'm trying to figure out what the consumer practice is really going to look like. And then two, how can this help beyond the consumer marketing side? Yeah, so I mean, your your remark is, is very interesting because I would tend to agree, right? I'm not going to go to the store and scan every single item. I think on certain items, we care a lot more than on others. For instance, in the, in the fresh food space, or in this case, in the, uh, in the seafood space, we're much more inclined to, to want to know what we're eating. And, you know, there are several studies that, that show that people are scanning a lot more, but also that people are caring a lot more about transparency from the brands. Movi published a stat that was uh, basically saying that 70% or 75%, if I'm not mistaken, of the customers would switch to a brand that is more transparent than another brand. And that is part of the transparency story. It's not the whole transparency story, but it's a big part. So I think minds are changing. I think it also depends on the kind of product. I don't think we would actually care that much about the provenance of a can of Coke, for instance. However, Coke is one of our customers and they have different marketing campaigns, more in the space of gamification, customer loyalty, and people do scan. You would be surprised and it's increasing in Europe, in the US, in Asian markets, it's already very, very present. Every transaction nowadays on, on a mobile phone goes through a, through a QR code. And this is also now changing in the US and in Europe. Okay. Beyond marketing, like I feel like it would be really interesting on... Maybe lettuce, for example, because we in the U.S. are having a lot of foodborne illness problems. So that seems like a place where we might see something like this have benefits outside of gamification or just making me feel good about where my stuff came from. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great use case. You definitely heard about the E. coli bacteria, right? In salmon, you also have uh, the same kind of problems. I think these food safety, food recalls beyond marketing are, are great examples. Today, when we recall food, we basically have to trash huge, huge amounts of, of salads or salmons or whatever is infected with serialization or with batch level serialization. You can really target the recalls and make them much more effective. Actually, one brand we worked with on recalls, and I can't mention their names, but basically published a stat that was saying that they would do recalls 40 times faster than before through serialization and through the use of online services, like everything. So that's that's one thing, food safety and generally product safety. I think there are also lots of internal use cases. Um, now, if you go more into luxury items, luxury brands have faced pretty big problems. Two big ones are counterfeit and backdoor goods. So counterfeit, I think we all know them. Those are the items that are being copied by um, by counterfeiters. And basically serializing the products and tracing them through their life cycle really helps uh, fighting counterfeit products. Backdoor goods are goods that are actually genuine, but produced illegally in the factories that the, the luxury brands are, are employing, uh, usually at night, and they go through parallel trading. So having a unique identity, a web-enabled unique identity on the product really helps also uh, fighting these, these problems. And let's go back to the, the broader trend here. So take me through a world where I have basically an identity for every single item. So 
from my, my sweater to my can of soup? I mean, what does this mean from a big picture level, do you think? From a big picture level, it means you'll be able to see the invisible, right? The flow of these goods right now is invisible and they appear here and there, usually with massive gaps between two steps. Whereas here, you'll be able to trace them much more accurately to know where they are, to know also who is using the products, and also to be able to do, as, as we mentioned before, targeted recalls and other things around food safety. I think obviously we will need to have interaction mechanisms evolving because uh, I don't think you and I would like a world where we have to scan manually every single item we buy. I don't think that that makes sense. I think we're at the beginning of of this phase of of mass serialization and mass identities for uh, uh, CPG apparel and, and, and food products. I think we will see some very interesting evolutions. And one that's fascinating for me is that you see the frontier between tagged and fully connected products erasing step by step. You have today things like printed electronics. You can print uh, NFC tags at scale just with layers of inks. And you can actually embed these layers of things into a product label. So you can really have a label that becomes an NFC tag. Uh, You also have things like battery-free Bluetooth. Uh, A partner we work with is called Williot. They they are capable of doing semi-printed battery-free Bluetooth tags at very low cost. So you can really imagine today luxury products having these Bluetooth tags tomorrow probably different kind of cpg products so i actually have a few things i have some luxury products with bluetooth tags in them and i don't know if they're williots or not but i I have written about that company i think it's pretty awesome it is yeah right now the world seems to be very focused on putting these things in goods to market to me so i have a purse with a bluetooth tag and if i scan it it doesn't to me if i had a bluetooth tag in my purse i would want it to do things like let me know if I've left it someplace, right? But what it does is it just lets, if I scan it with my phone, then I get the chance to like, at best go to a website, but usually it's asking me to download an app so I can interact with marketing material. And to me, this just seems like a colossal waste of really good technology. So I, I'm curious if we just have to get through this marketing first step and we'll see real things or what is, why aren't we seeing more utility here? I totally agree with you. And I think this is the first step, you know, what we're capable of putting today in these tags, in these printed electronics tags, our identities. Uh, we can put also, also URLs in there to facilitate the interaction, but we can't do sensing, for instance, yet. It's coming very quickly, but when we can do that, uh, I think use cases will become a lot more compelling from a consumer standpoint. Imagine when, you're, when your handbag can start sensing the environment, uh, sensing the temperature or sensing the pollution level and alerting you when, when you are actually walking for too long in a, in a polluted area. These kind of use cases are actually not that far away anymore, I think. Uh, we see now printed electronics combined with, uh, with sensing We also see battery-free IoT devices based on Bluetooth combined with sensing. So to your point, I think today, from a consumer standpoint, it's largely marketing, product provenance, and also uh, product authenticity. I think tomorrow we'll see much more exciting use cases. When all of my things have this type of identity, I wonder about concepts like privacy. And is there a point at which we should be communicating with people who buy this stuff that there's information that can be gleaned possibly about them or from them from everyday products. Yeah, I think we'll have to explain that there is a active tag in there or I mean they're not really active, they're semi active tags. Uh, so we'll we'll have to explain that. Being only for from an interaction standpoint, if it's a if it's not a visual tag, then how do you know you can interact with your with your bag? And I think then yes, we will have to to find a, a language to be able to explain to consumers the type of information that uh, their items are gathering. And I think that's a massive challenge. It's a massive challenge to make it accessible, to really develop a language so that people can understand and people can put in the balance of you know cost to their privacy versus benefits. For that to happen, we really need a, an easy language to understand. Okay. We've sort of answered a lot of the questions I have around this big macro question, which is... What kind of technologies do we need to have in place if we're going to reach a trillion sensors? Like, what are some of the things we need to think about and develop? 
one big thing that I've promoted throughout my career is to connect these things into the existing networks. A lot of the things that are, are happening in the IoT are actually building intranets of things. And I've dedicated my research career and, and my, my business career to basically ensuring that this is not the case and that things are really connected to the internet and things are really connected to the web. Because if we want things to happen at large scale, this is what needs to happen. We don't, we shouldn't think of IoT use cases simply as one phone, one IoT device, right? We really have to think of interconnecting these different things over the internet and over the web. More down to earth, we need technologies to evolve. In particular, if we consider things that don't have access to normal source of power, we need to think of, of uh, battery free technologies. Technologies that are harvesting energy. Then on the data side, we're talking about masses of, of data, just like completely unprecedented. Just one trillion unique identities is something already very, very hard to handle for a database, yet alone actually analyzing the flow of these identities. We're considering trillions and trillions of data points. So I think that on the data side, we still have a, a way to go to be able to leverage the, the data streams that these things will create. And does that mean we need different database formats? Does it mean we need different ways of handling streaming data? I, I don't know what that means. Yeah, I guess ultimately it's, it's on analytics. It's on also making early decisions. Things like machine learning can help to analyze massive amount of data as it comes in. And yeah, in terms of analytics, in terms of the way we store these data points, there, there's still a lot of need for, for improvements. I think the good news is we will not go from billions to trillions in, in one go. And the technology is evolving in many interesting ways. Excellent. All right. Well, Dominic, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week.